Hi, and welcome to Ontology Talk. Uh, today, we're honored to have uh, Professor Jeff Sutcliffe, uh, who is also, we should say, joining uh, Articulate Software as our Chief Scientific Officer. He is a professor of computer science at the University of Miami, where he leads the TPTP World Research Group that he's going to tell us about. And its work is uh, centered on logic and automated theorem proving. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Hi. Hi, Adam. Nice to join you. Yeah, yes, um, as you can see in my office, even though I'm on sabbatical this semester, I should be in Berlin or Luxembourg, but thanks to COVID, I couldn't travel. And so I'm here with my door locked, getting buried in research and automated theorem proving and logic and enjoying it. Fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, I wanted to just get started maybe with a, a bit of an orientation for our viewers. Can you tell us about what is automated reasoning? So automated reasoning is, and more generally, more specifically, the topic of automated theorem proving that I work in is in simple terms and the most front end of it, one say the derivation of conclusions that follow inevitably from known facts. All right, so that's okay. And, the, and a nice feature of it in logic, when you do this, it's regardless of meaning. If you're talking about Socrates or Postman or dogs, it doesn't matter because the computer doesn't know what you're talking about anyway. And so it can be done in complete abstraction from meaning. So in, from an easy example, we might say, if it's raining, I'll bring my umbrella. It is raining and you conclude inevitably you will bring your umbrella. But from the computer perspective, you might've said, if A then B, it is A, therefore B. And the computer doesn't mind. And in the classical logics that I work in, I have been working in a lot, what you expect is your known facts to be consistent, non-contradictory. And we'll talk about that because in the real world, of course, a, there are a lot of contradictions in our minds and information that we might even read on the internet. So there's a flip side to the coin of, as well as deriving conclusions that follow from known facts because we would like those known facts to be consistent or non-contradictory, part of the automated theorem proving efforts are to show that a set of facts are indeed consistent and non-contradictory to themselves. Uh, as I said, of course, in the real world, this isn't always the case. And so you can go from the non-classical logic perspective into other logics where contradictions are completely acceptable things can be both true and false at the same time, and that's okay. And so that takes us into the non-classical world of logic of paradox and uh, other logics like that, particularly, as you might hear from my accent, developed by the Australians who are really big into having logics of paradox. I think that's the general picture, of course, is technical details, but we don't need to delve into those yet. Yeah, that's a fantastic orientation. Uh, so uh, most of the work that I've been doing certainly is in uh, classical logics where things are either true or false. But yeah, there's this whole other world that people are exploring that's uh, uh, certainly a little mysterious to me, but uh, also very exciting. The example I like to give Adam, I don't know, many people enjoy the TV series, The Walking Dead. And of course, in The Walking Dead, there are people who are alive, true. There are people who are dead, false. But there's also people who are alive and dead at the same time, the walking dead. So they both true and false at the same time. And so there's a real example of where you have things that are both true and false at the same time in a really good TV show. <laughs> well, great. If the zombie apocalypse comes, we'll be well equipped with theorem proving that can handle it. <laughs> So uh, maybe I can get to uh, a topic that uh, maybe would be more relevant uh, for some of our uh, corporate viewers. So what's the main set of business applications that you see? You know, how is this relevant to sort of practical computer scientists and engineers that might want to apply some of this technology to problems they have that they're trying to solve for their business? Yeah, so that's uh, obviously... <laughs> One might say in the business terms, a $64,000 question, how do you make money out of doing this without being an academic? Uh, so the big money push at the moment, and it has been really for probably a decade now, is in the verification and design of software and hardware, computer hardware, that uh, meets certain criteria of safety and robustness. 
And there's a large amount of research ever since Intel discovered their floating point error, people realized you really have to make sure that your software is right. It's most annoying if you're using a computer or your phone and the, the application crashes. People might remember the blue screen of death from a particular company at some point. And so now this robustness of software and hardware is a big application and all of the large manufacturers and software developers expend a lot of money to do that analysis, you take whatever you want to test, for example, a computer program, you want to make sure it's not going to die under certain conditions, it's not going to crash. You model that computer program in a logic and then use the logic to verify properties of the program in terms of making sure that certain things will or will not happen during the execution of the program and hence know what's going to happen. And the same applies to hardware in a very simple case that people might understand in the front of your car, there's a little computer chip that when you hit a tree, it tells the airbag to go off, all right, so that you don't end up with the steering wheel through your chest. And you want that computer chip to work very reliably. It shouldn't work 98% of the time or 99. It has to work all the time. So you can analyze the hardware in the chip and the software that runs on that chip that deploys your airbag to ensure that it meets criteria of safety. So that's been big business. There are other applications which are not as hot now. Certainly one application is in process analysis. If you've got a factory that makes cut steel or wood or welds things, you wanna make sure, for example, that if you've got a large blade coming down, you shouldn't have anybody's hand in the way at that time. So you can do process analysis. There's a language called the process specification language supported by the uh, NIH and also DOI, which allows you to write down about what's happening in your factory or in your traffic lights of a car signal system or an air traffic control system or some medical hardware software interaction. So you can analyze the sequence of events that could possibly occur and make sure that they are safe and meet certain criteria. So that's a, a still quite a big area, but less well known and in some sense subsumed by the general area of software and hardware design. Coming up and emerging now, there's an emerging market for use of automated theorem proving and legal reasoning. This was originally done back in the 70s in a programming language called Prolog. By in UK to work out whether or not you had the right to get a residence permit in the UK. And that was done in Prologue. And it's really the technology wasn't strong enough now, then. But of course, this is always a situation. If they come to a legal disagreement, often at the moment now, or almost inevitably, it's going to be decided by a judge or lawyers or a jury in some sad situations. And you'd like to be able to automate a lot of that. For example, on the American border with Mexico, there's a large number of people seeking asylum in the US, and to be able to process them quickly and efficiently according to the laws of the country, you can capture those laws and logic and do the processing quickly and much cheaper than hiring another attorney in order to do that kind of work. In Europe, this is big business now because of their GDPR laws for privacy. Companies have to prove that they are meeting the requirements of that law and you can do that. And one of the things I'm sort of a little involved with is capturing some aspects of that law so that companies can very quickly and formally show that their policies of privacy of data are meeting the requirements of the law. And going sort of a little bit further down that chain, although it's still developing, is the notion of ethical activity. So we have a lot of intelligent autonomous systems, IAS is coming into the world. Self-driving cars is the one that people are very familiar with, of course. And that self-driving car has to make ethical decisions. And when we do it as humans, we have a notion of what is right and what is wrong instilled into us by society and our parents. But you've got to instill that into the car. So if a car is driving along, and children step out into the road from one side and an adult steps out into the road from the other side, what's the ethical decision of that car given Newtonian physics says the car can't stop, what's it going to do? And that's starting to build now. And as I alluded to earlier, 
in order to capture these notions of ethics in particular and also law and medical decision making you need something more than classical logics and that's why there's an emergence of interest in non-classical automated theorem proving for non-classical logics so i think those are the things where the money is has been is at and where it might be in the future yeah that's a great comprehensive overview and and i like that you've uh, mentioned some of the history there of uh, early AI, say in the 70s and then the 80s, when expert systems were really the hot thing. And right. the the, uh, the applications for expert systems certainly haven't gone away. Uh, right. It's just that we were sort of frustrated with the technology back then. The technology is right. so much better. I hope that we'll see a, a real resurgence in this area. I, I think you will, Adam. It's, it's coming and it requires research just to get this and to get the tools that run fast enough to make the decisions precisely and in a way that is satisfactory and a way that they can explain themselves so that if a med if a piece of theorem proving says i expect think this based on this i expect this you should give this treatment to a patient the patient typically wants to know why you know so why <laughs> are you offering to give me a hip replacement well and you need an explanation downstream on why it's legal why it's ethical and why it's an appropriate treatment for for some you know person whose hip is beginning to give out. My father's did, that's for sure. We'll pause here and return uh, for more discussion with Professor Sutcliffe in part two of this series.